Psalm 100, a psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. From songs of temple praise to funeral dirges, you will find it all. If you had your Bible and you flipped through it, you would see some 200 plus songs recorded in the scriptures. The Bible says that some pieces of poetry were sung, chanted, or intended for musical accompaniment. And over 70% of these songs in scripture are recorded in the book of Psalms. Now, it's no surprise to us that the book of Psalms has the most songs recorded, 150 to be exact. 150 chapters are each a different song. But it might surprise you to know that there are other, two other songbooks in Scripture. You have the book of Song of Solomon, an epic love story between a bride and a groom. And the book of Lamentations is written by the weeping prophet Jeremiah. A set of five dirges, songs mourning the fall of Jerusalem. In 1 Kings chapter 4, it says that Solomon, King Solomon, wrote over a thousand songs in his day, although they're not all recorded in Scripture. Our longest song is found in Psalm 119, and we find our two shortest songs recorded in the book of 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, we see the trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord. They were accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and other instruments. And the singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord, and they sang out, He is good. His love endures forever. Amen. And the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for his splendor and his holiness as they went ahead of the army, singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Both of those are the shortest songs throughout Scripture, and they're only seven Hebrew words long. The first song in Scripture is recorded in Exodus chapter 15. It's called the Song of Moses. It happens after the children of Israel safely cross through the Red Sea. If you want to hear a sermon on that, we preach through that passage back in March. And, and also the, the last song in the Bible recorded in the book of Revelation is also the Song of Moses. John sees those in Revelation 15 who have overcome the beast singing the song of Moses. Now, the lyrics are different, but the message is very, very similar. Our focus this morning is on a song. It is a song of, of thanksgiving, very fitting because it's Thanksgiving week. It's short and sweet, five verses long. The psalm of thanksgiving might have been sung by a person sacrificing a thank offering, or it might have been sung by worshipers making their way into the temple. In the early church, Psalm 100 was used every morning as the morning prayer. And throughout church history, this song has been sung by many Christian brothers and sisters. The people would engage. They call this the old 100th. Right, first appeared in a Psalter back in 1551. They've been singing this song. Psalm 100 contains a statement of how to give thanks, our principles for worship, an explanation of why God's people must give thanks, knowing that we are his people of worship, an invitation to give thanks, praise, and worship. And a final great expression of praise and thanksgiving, showing us our need for perpetual worship. This morning's main idea is worship the Lord with gladness. We want to worship the Lord with gladness. 
Let's look at your scripture. Rachel's already read it for us on the screen. Beautiful job. Verse 1 and 2 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him in joyful songs. Verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. As you can see, this song is one of singing. And it's not a funeral dirge. It is not an emotionless song. This song, there's shouting, there's gladness, there's joyfulness, thanks and praise. I don't know about you guys, but I love singing. Most people don't know as much I love singing. And not just any song. I love scripturally informed good songs. But uh, let's keep it 100. That's the name of the title of the sermon, Let's Keep It 100. And for, for those of us who don't, are not cool with the hip language, keep it 100 means like keeping it cool, real, authentic. So, so keep it in 100, being real. Little known fact about me, well, is that uh, I used to sing in the choir at church. And uh, I used to even sing special music. Now, if you ever heard me sing, you would say, who ever thought that was a good idea to put you in front of people singing? Uh, but it's true. When uh, I used to uh, be associate pastor in California, and I would lead the worship services, and I would, I would introduce the song we're going to sing and talk about scripture with it, but when it was time to sing, I had to take two big steps back. They would turn the microphone off, and I led singing back here. In, in uh, Federal Way, when I was associate pastor, I did the same thing, except I had to go sit off to the side, and another guy came up to lead the singing. So, matter of fact, I, uh, I was sitting in the church one time singing in the, with the congregation, and this girl had uh, this Tourette's, and she kept looking back at me, growling. And her mom said, uh, Frank, if you could do us a favor, if you could sit on the other side of the church, you're really distracting us. So, like... Not good. And, and if, if I didn't learn my lesson there, one, one Mother's Day, my uh, brother had been saved that weekend, and I wanted to do this special thing. And I, at a church we were planning in Cave Junction, a cappella even, I, I, I solo sang a song, I Wasn't Wondering Sheep. And I found that song, and I listened to it a few years later, and I thought, what in the world was I thinking? But these days, I still sing. I, I love to sing, but I try really hard not to be distracting. Uh, I used to sit up front in a church, and the pastor or the song leader said, Frank, can you do me a favor? When you sing, can you go to the back of the church and just sing to, the, just sing to yourself? Because even the Lord doesn't want to hear that, right? <laughs> but, but Melanie Showbrook, I sang with her on Thursday night, and she said, I really sing good. So, and if you want to find out why that's funny, go watch Rod's sermon. So, but uh, now let, let's look back at the verses in, in verses one and two. Here are some very valuable principles in praising the Lord. Let's look at this, verse one and two. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Shout for joy to the Lord. Shout. Cry out. Raise the war cry or alarm. Rejoice. Cheer. This is what we're called to do. This shouting was loud. When was the last time you shouted for the Lord? Yeah? Awesome. You know, we have a tendency to shout at ball games. We shout at our kids' sporting events. We shout at our kids, right, our neighbors, that guy that just cuts you off. So we know how to shout. But why not shout for the Lord? It's convicting for me. Ready? <laughs> the Lord is worthy for shouting for joy, Right? He is worthy for worshiping with gladness. He is worthy of our joyful songs, our praise. He's worthy of our thanksgiving. Look at verse 1 again. Who is called to shout for joy to the Lord? 
all the earth. All the earth. Not just Christians. You see, this is a uh, missionary invitation. The psalmist is calling everyone, Jews, Gentiles, believers, non-believers, not yet believers, all of creation to shout and rejoice before the king. Praise the Lord. Lord. This is a universal call, a universal summons, cosmic in scope, driving the mission of the church. The call goes out beyond the chosen people, but to all the people of the earth. God is their king too, regardless of whether they're aware of it or they acknowledge it. John Piper says this, he says, evangelism exists because worship doesn't. Not enough people are joining into the worship shouting of joy for the Lord. This is why we preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Because some days you get up going and you just don't feel like worshiping the Lord in song. And this is a problem. We need to renew, to to renovate our minds, to recalibrate them. To, as verses 3 and 5 say, to know that the Lord is God. Know the Lord is God. He is good and he is faithful. He is the sole creator, redeemer, and shepherd. He alone is worthy of worship, not us and not our ego. It would be accurate to express this idea by saying that the people of God are to praise God loudly because they are happy with Him. Charles Spurgeon said of this verse, he says, Our happy God should be worshipped by a happy people. A cheerful spirit is in keeping with His nature, His acts and His gratitude, which we should cherish for His mercies. Verse 2 says we are to worship the Lord with gladness. Worship is often translated as serve. We are to serve the Lord with our worship and to do so with joy. Oftentimes I, I think we violate this call from the psalmist. Serving and worshiping the Lord without joy, without gladness. And it is insulting to God. Now, I know that those who profess to be Christian don't set out to insult their God. They don't set out to forsake the Lord and forget his benefits. They don't set out to to forget their once bold love for him. But life happens. Things of this world distract us and call our attention away. We have deadlines to meet at work and at school. Our kids need transportation to some event. Your neighbor needs help with a project. Someone misinterpreted a text or an email, and it has led to anxious feelings. You're struggling to get your bills paid, and then your spouse loses their job, or a kid gets sick and ends up in the hospital. Life just happens, and we lose focus. Then it's Sunday, and we know we should be at church. Verse 2 tells us to come, to be brought in before the Lord with joyful songs, but sometimes you just don't feel like it. So what do you do? What do you do? Look at verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. We are His We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. When we don't feel like worshiping the Lord, we need to re-educate ourselves. We need to shift our gaze and our focus from us and ourselves and what's going on in our lives. And we need to notice. We need to learn to realize that the Lord is God. This informs our worship. This is why we shout. This is why we worship. This is why we come before him. We are not to worship uninformed. We are not to be like the people of Athens who Paul spoke to in Acts chapter 7 who had come to the altar and worshiped at the inscription of an unknown God. 
We are not like the woman at the well in John chapter 4 who Jesus speaks to as she's drawing water from a well who he says is worshiping a God that she did not know. We are his people. We are a people who worship what we know. True worshipers who worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. And this is why this is the God we worship. We are his people. The foundation of our praise is that we belong to God and we are his sheep. If you're taking notes, point two is we are his people of worship. We must remember we are his. It is he who made us. We are his. We belong to the creator of the world. He made us. The creation is made for the creator. We are his and we answer to him. The creation, us, are accountable to him, the creator. The creator has absolute sovereign control over his creation. Keeping it 100. The creator and the sustainer of the entire cosmos knows your name. And he doesn't have to get on Facebook and stalk you to find out things about you. He knows you. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. He knows your thoughts without you even having to say them. And he cares about you. That breath that you just took, all praise to him. All praise to him. He is a benevolent God who pours out blessings on all of creation. The believers and the not yet believers. He is benevolent, he is good, and he is kind. He made us. And we are disobedient when we do not worship him in praise. Even those who are not believers are being disobedient and not offering up praise and worship. They are to repent, believe, and join us in that worship. And if they refuse to, there is a day of judgment appointed to them. And they will have to answer the question. Why have you not worshipped me? Verse 1 tells us the cosmic call to worship of shout for joy for the Lord is for all the earth. Not just believers. But we are his people. The sheep of his pasture. The believers know what grace is. We understand what forgiveness is. We are protected in his hand, shielded from the wrath of the Father that will one day pour out on creation who did not worship the one true God. We are his people who are in a privileged position of grace, via grace. We are cared for, fed, loved, and protected. The psalmist could have chosen any other illustration out there, but he chose that of a shepherd and sheep. The very picture shows us a relationship of much concern and care from the Creator. John Calvin made it the opening chapter of his Institutes of Christian Religion when he pointed out that the natural result of knowing God is to know ourselves. And that the only way we are to really know ourselves is by knowing God. Knowing God and knowing ourselves always go together. We are his. We are his people. We are his sheep. This is a corporate acknowledgement Yes, we're individually saved. Yes, we're individually sanctified. Yes, we are individually responsible for our actions, but we are his people. We are his people who are called to be together. We want to be educated so that it will inform our praise and our exaltation of the one true God. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says, enter his praise or enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise to him. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Worshippers are entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise together. This is a communal act of worship. A call to public worship at the temple gates with a gathered congregation. We are to come with thanksgiving and praise as we enter in to that. 
Point number three is praise and worship. We are to enter his gates with thanksgiving, and we should keep on praising him. His goodness should be our focus of attention. One of the many, many privileges I have of serving here at Redwood or in River Valley is knowing everyone's stories. The good, the bad, and the ugly, right? The highs, the lows, and the really low lows. I'm in a couple of different life groups, and those in my life group, man, we are living life together. Yeah, we share praises, faith, what's going on in our lives, but we also share our struggles and our failures with each other. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We are weeping with those who are weeping. And oftentimes we ask ourselves, how can we worship God when our spouse just left us? How can we worship God and shout for praise when our 16-year-old daughter has gone off the rails and is not listening to our counsel? When the waves of depression are crashing over our heads and we think that we just can get air, but we take on more water. How can we embrace this psalm when our loved one who has cancer or we just buried them in the grave? How do we embrace the truth of this song when we just got laid off and our future looks so bleak? We sing praises corporately as a congregation, and, and we're obeying the command to do that. We're singing good theology into our souls, but I see something else as well when we sing corporately. We are together acknowledging the truth. In spite of the trials that we're in, all those truths are being sung around us. We proclaim his wondrous works to those in the world. Helping us and unbelievers know that the Lord is God. And we shift our gaze from what we see around us to the heavens. And something beautiful happens. When I sing and I look at a single mom who just lost her job, and she's singing, it is well with my soul, and she really means it, it does something to my heart. When I see a friend whose spouse just left them and they're singing, Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. That encourages me. When I see a friend who I know is struggling with depression and they're over there singing, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, Upward I look, and I see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied. It encourages me. When I look and I see a lady who just lost her spouse, and with tears in her eyes, she's saying to Jesus, you wipe away all my tears, you mend the broken heart, you're the answer to it all, Jesus. You wipe away all my tears. You mend the broken heart. You're the answer to it all, Jesus. It does something to us. It does something to our hearts. It emboldens us, emboldens us, causing worship, true, confessed worship to charge forward and defeat the enemy. When we sing, we are making war. A heart that is set on praising the Lord will have a hard time giving in to temptation. When we praise his name, it strengthens us for the trials that we are facing. When we're suffering, we should come before the Lord with thanksgiving and praise because it recalibrates us. And being with other people who are going through trials and singing out to the Lord blesses us. Psalm 51.11 says, But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Psalm 9.2 says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Psalm 51.14 says, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. 
You who are my God and my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Psalm 59, 16, but I will sing of your strength. In the morning, I will sing of your love. For you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. And Psalm 63, 7, because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. The worshipers are charged to make joyful noise, to serve, to come with singing, to enter the gates, to know that the Lord is God, to give thanks and to bless. Why? Why do we do that? Look at verse 5. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord's mercy and truth, like God himself, last forever. Perpetual worship. God is eternally and faithfully good in his covenant love and loyalty. And they never fail, and they are to be praised by generation to generation to generation. This whole thing is like one big worship practice for all of eternity. There is no end in sight for his love and his faithfulness. Knowing this should also fuel our praise and worship to the Lord. The person and the work of Jesus Christ reveals these truths to us about the Lord. The gospel of Christ should electrify the kind of worship the psalmist commands in Psalm 100. River Valley, let's keep it 100. Let us shout for joy for the Lord. Because he is a God who is faithful. He is a God who is full of good and loving kindness. Let's pray.